think it will go well. Um, very pleased to welcome you today to uh, this new uh, webinar hosted by the Lab Quantique on quantum techs. Uh, today, we'll, as always, we'll have uh, three sessions. Um, but a few words about the Lab Quantique for those who join us for the first time. We are a uh, Paris-based uh, not-for-profit um, and uh, we are trying to run a large range of uh, new initiatives to support the quantum ecosystem worldwide. So we started by um, meetup webinars, conferences. Um, I hope that you attended the, four, the former conferences, but uh, they are available on the, our webpage and YouTube if you, if you wish to see them. Um, hi, everyone. Hi, Marta. We are also running, uh, we run some uh, hackathon and um, we are trying also to support startups that try to deploy their technologies by linking them with uh, the entire ecosystem, especially the end users. And of course, we are also trying to grow uh, this not non for profit. So if you have any ideas or would like to support or join the team, uh, feel free to send us an email or contact us because we will be very happy to uh, grow the initiative. A uh, few words about uh, the last sessions and how we will uh, also give you access to uh, the different um, uh, streams that, that we already produced. So uh, you can either have access to them um, through uh, the meetup group uh, from which you joined. But uh, after the session, we'll also send you an email uh, through Zoom. And uh, as I mentioned, we, it's uh, streaming live on YouTube. And uh, you can also have access to everything on our website, thelabquantique.com, or through the Twitter and LinkedIn accounts. Uh, last thing that I wanted to share before going into the session is that we also are looking for posts on Medium so as to um, simplify and make sure that everyone can get access to uh, knowledge about quantum technologies. So if you'd like to share your knowledge, some insights about uh, quantum technologies, please feel free to contact us to um, produce some posts for Medium. There is one, one rule, it should be less than 10 minutes because that's what most of the people are looking for. Uh, more than 10 minutes, we are quite sure that uh, few, only few people will read it. Um, and a few information about the next meetup that will take place on May 25th. So as of now, we have already two speakers that will attend, uh, Yohannis Kirenidis from QCWare and Jean-Christophe Yellois from Yol Development, that is a consulting uh, company that uh, issued a report on quantum technologies a few times ago. Today, uh, I'm very pleased to host this panel um, and uh, to welcome the speaker. So um, for the first time, we'll host a panel with three uh, investors. And that's why uh, it's not Christophe that is hosting uh, the session today, because he'll be a member of the, of the panel together with uh, Samir Kumar who, uh, uh, from uh, M12 and uh, Oliver Kahl from MIG Ventures. Then we'll have the pleasure to have Enrique Solano, uh, CEO of uh, IQM Germany. And um, last but not least, Medina Mazi from QNECT uh, will end the session today. Sorry, a few ground rules for the webinar. Um, first thing, we ask you not to broadcast your videos, and uh, even if you wish to, you cannot, because it's only for the people who, who attend the panels and the presentation. You are muted from the start uh, in order to have a good interaction for everyone and not to have too much noise. So if you wish to, um, to talk, please raise your hand through the Zoom uh, panel. And um, we, if, if, if possible, will give you uh, the possibility to talk and to interact with everyone. Uh, it's myself and Jean-Gabriel who, who can manage this. Um, if you'd like to ask any question, rather than to, uh, to use the chat, we ask you to use the Q&A because uh, they are public and everyone can vote or comment on your questions and try to answer and so on. I'd like you all uh, also that you, um, when trying to ask a question, please uh, tell who the question is uh, dedicated to and who you would like to uh, answer the question because as they will uh, last for the entire session, it will be easier for our panelists and for our uh, speakers to uh, know that the question is uh, directed to them. Um, and uh, this will be uh, my last word of introduction. So we'll start with the panel now. Um, 
And uh, the panel will be, so we have three panelists, as I mentioned, uh, Christophe, Oliver, and Samir. Um, as you may not know all of our panelists, I'll uh, start by asking them to introduce themselves. So uh, please, Christophe, can you, as you are also co-host of the session and president of, uh, of La Quantique, can you start by introducing, introducing yourself, please? Uh, you are muted. I'm mute. Yeah, that's it. I'm not very used to be on the other side in a way. Uh, so good afternoon. Good morning, everybody. So I'm Christophe Jorzak. I'm a partner at Quantum Nation. We're an investment fund, early stage, dedicated to quantum technologies, deep physics. Uh, that means um, disruptive technologies that are coming out of physics labs. We have 12 investments in the field of quantum technologies in Europe and North America. So probably the largest portfolio in the space in number, if not in dollars. Thank you, Christophe. Uh, Oliver, can you please introduce yourself? Sure, sure. Um, so hi, everybody. My name is Oliver Powell. I work here at MIG, which is one of the largest deep tech investors in Germany, if not even the largest. Um, we make investments on a pretty broad spectrum. So on the deep tech end, obviously, we talk about quantum technologies here. So you know, at the quantum technology uh, end of the spectrum. But then we move all the way across to biotech and pharma. And uh, we cover pretty much everything in between. So that's medical technologies, semiconductor tech, um, but also the digital health sector and fintechs, which are the, the latest additions. Um, we're based here in Munich in Germany, um, make investments mostly in, in the German speaking regions, but also in the rest of Europe. <clears throat> and one of our recent ones is actually present as well. So IQM um, in Helsinki, um, we invest also fairly stage agnostically, meaning that uh, we have small investment tickets on the order of a few hundred K for the seed stage companies, but then we can follow suit and follow along as the company develops and grows and uh, handle bigger tickets in the single digit million area up until say 10 million, uh, that wouldn't be unheard of. And um, yeah, that's pretty Thank much you. it, thanks. Yeah, thanks a lot. And Samir, please. Thanks, Robert. Uh, hi, everyone. Samir Kumar, uh, Managing Director for M12, which is Microsoft's venture fund. Uh, I'm based in San Francisco, and for the fund, I handle our deep tech, frontier tech investments. Uh, we currently have one investment in the quantum computing space, which is SciQuantum. Uh, many of you may have seen the recent press uh, in uh, Bloomberg uh, announcing the company's investors. Um, and as you know, Microsoft is obviously uh, a key player in uh, developing quantum computing solutions. Um, we are global. Um, I'm based in San Francisco, but we do uh, investments all around the world. Uh, we're very active in Europe, Israel, India, uh, Australia, uh, all of North America. And, uh, you know, as we look at the quantum space, I think, uh, you know, currently we have one investment, but we are actively watching the space to see what makes sense uh, to do in the future. Uh, typically, we like to come in at the Series A and later stage, uh, but occasionally we do do make uh, seed investments as well. Thanks a lot. Um, so for our panel, I will try. I'd like to uh, discuss about three different topics. Um, first one being the opportunities and in, uh, investment thesis of everyone. Um, then how how to manage talents uh, in a quantum um, te quantum tech startups, and the last will be about ecosystems and so on. Um, we'll try to, uh, to discuss during 15 to 20 minutes so that we can have uh, time to take uh, the questions from, uh, from the audience. So please do not hesitate to use the Q&A, um, dear attendees, if you want to ask anything. And uh, we'll try to keep, as mentioned, five to 10 minutes to answer uh, all, all your questions. Um, but first, first thing first is, uh, yeah, I'd like to understand how funds can uh, invest in quantum technologies because they tend to be rather a long-term investment. And, um, and they have to match the fact that, uh, that you need to go out in a reasonable amount of time. So um, Christophe, as you're only dedicated to quantum technologies, I'd like to have your feedback uh, on uh, how do you manage the fact that uh, quantum technologies are rather long shots and uh, rather long-term investment. And uh, do you see any low-hanging fruits and short-term applications to quantum technologies? And of course, uh, Samir Oliver, if you want to uh, jump in, don't, do not hesitate. Very good question. Thank you, Robert. Uh, first, I think indeed it's important to realize that uh, these technologies are uh, relatively long term, uh, especially uh, quantum computing. So uh, people should not 
uh, have uh, expectations that this generates, uh, for example, in this case, uh, significant revenues within a couple of years. Uh, we're talking about 10 years horizon for this kind of investment, but obviously we're also interested, uh, we look at opportunities for returns earlier than that. And that's why being a quantum investor, really focusing on the sector, it's really uh, important that we're um, investing in, uh, in, in the different sectors. And, and what I mean is uh, we're investing in quantum sensing, quantum communication and cybersecurity, uh, deep physics, and, uh, and also uh, quantum computing. Maybe I will dive into that a little bit. Uh, quantum sensing has rather short-term um, uh, business commercial opportunities. For example, we've invested in a, in a company in Switzerland, Tunami, that's already selling uh, devices and will generate uh, significant revenues uh, this year. So growing fast. Uh, in the cyberspace, post quantum crypto is also something that you can apply in devices. We've seen very good, uh, very interesting collaboration between two of our startups, Kets in the UK, that does a QRNG and, uh, and crypto next for post quantum. And this is a device integrating both technology that could be of application as soon as next year. Uh, quantum inspired softwares with um, Multiverse, for example, that were with us uh, two weeks ago, runs on classical hardware with quantum uh, concepts. And, uh, and of course, there's quantum computing with uh, relatively longer term. And there, what we is also look at low hanging fruits, as you mentioned earlier. So there are some applications that are other than others. Uh, uh, computational fluid dynamics, for example, uh, is, um, is relatively long term, uh, whereas finance uh, optimization problems uh, could be tackled with uh, earlier. And uh, we're also thinking that uh, quantum simulation uh, for scientific discovery is a field of interest in very short term. Uh, and that's why uh, we're making more investment in Pascal, a company that is developing a, a quantum simulator. So all in all, I think for us really being uh, on this, it's pretty important that we have uh, companies with different maturities. And I think that's something we can find uh, definitely in this space. Thank you, Gustav. Very extensive question. Samir, you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, so I think it's a, it's a very valid point. You need to have a long view uh, when you're making quantum investments. So certainly funds that have uh, specific return profiles, like, hey, we need to see a return in the next five years or something like that. It becomes difficult to think about what percentage of your portfolio could you allocate and dedicate to quantum investments. I think, you know, while we are independent and financially driven, we do look at quantum computing as a uh, quote unquote vanguard bet. So really revolutionizing the field of computing. So despite the long horizon for seeing a return, certainly a high risk investment, we think it's absolutely worth it because the payoff and the return, if you're successful or even partially successful, uh, is game changing as far as uh, the field of computing goes. Um, now, certainly as you think about, you know, building a large scale or scaled up fault tolerant quantum computer, that's on a long horizon. But as Christoph mentioned, there are adjacent technologies that you could see benefit from much sooner than that. So certainly quantum key distribution, quantum networking, uh, quantum sensing, quantum inspired optimization, which is, mm -hmm. I think, an exciting area where you're taking uh, inspiration from algorithmic research and developing quantum algorithms, but finding opportunities to implement that on classical hardware. And I think this is an important point because ultimately, if you're thinking about revenue and building a business, you know, certainly if you know, you're building a true quantum computer, that is game changing. But the other thing you have to think about is where can you show business value and when and what time horizon will you be able to show business value? Hmm. And so I think quantum inspired optimization where if you're able to work with customers, you're able to show uh, that you can solve real problems today and do it better than available alternatives. And that is a, a source of generating revenue, uh, then why not? And uh, I think those kinds of solutions, even Microsoft is also investing in. Um, so I think things are on a spectrum. Uh, I think on the hardware side, you know, I, I think everyone agrees that you know, the, the prize is a scaled up fault tolerant machine, but there are steps that are taken to getting there. And some of those steps you can find commercial value and business value sooner uh, than it would be uh, to actually build a fault tolerant machine. Thank you, Samia. Um, I, I would like to react on what you just said, uh, Samir. Um, so it kind of uh, make me think about, so mentioning that um, the, the payoff and so large bet, but payoff and returns can be very important. 
um, I used to work a lot with people in biotech, and uh, and they have almost the same um, the same way to describe their investment, uh, especially when uh, companies are at a very early stage, when, when they only have a target and they have to go through the whole process, so ten to twelve years. But if it works, it will be in terms of billions of euros, so it's worth taking the risk. So Oliver, as you both run, um, I mean, investments in in biotech and also in Quenlab. I would like to have your feedback on, um, do you see any uh, similar um, development in, in with, between quantum and other fields? Or do you see any, uh, and what are also the specifics to quantum technologies in terms of development and risks? It's a very good question. Um, I think, first of all, I think the analogy is, is uh, it, fit, it fits quite well, meaning that um, quantum developments take time. and um, it's a long journey from the development circle that you have to go through, especially with you, when you talk about the biotech startups, you will have these clinical trials and those can take years, sometimes longer than a decade to actually get to the market. And that is similar in the case of, um, I think, quantum tech. But then again, I think it comes back also to what uh, Christoph and Samir were saying. It depends really on what sector of quantum tech do you want to go into, right? And there are the low hanging fruits that you referred to earlier. So those are the ones that are more easily addressable where the market is not too distant. And there are applications out there already in the market. So you can actually have um, a few ideas of what the market looks like, how the market works, what are the dynamics, what are the characteristics. Um, and most importantly, with every um, development, um, you want to generate value on the customer side, right? And the, the only way to actually be successful in the long term is to be able to quantify and correctly quantify that value to the customer. Now that's particularly difficult with um, markets that are really in their infancy at the moment, where you don't really see um, how, marge, how much of a, a benefit this will actually bring to the customer. And this is where it really becomes difficult because in um, in pharma and biotech, you do have at least a few benchmarks of what to compare to. Whereas with quantum, um, it's still a very academically driven field. Hmm. And therefore, it's really hard to gauge what or how large the, the actual benefit to the customer will ultimately be. It will be there, certainly, but uh, from, a, from, from a pure marketing perspective, that's, um, that's difficult and risky, therefore. Um, and then there's a, a second um, question, which I, or a second aspect to this question that I think is also important, which comes back to the question of who will build those startups and who will you need to actually be successful in the long run. And that comes down to talent, right? So currently um, it's, it's a young and really uh, early stage market that's just developing as we speak. And um, people are scarce, right? good people who actually understand the, the real, the, the hardcore details of, of what is being developed aren't that many currently. I think there will be a progression and some development there, but ultimately it really depends on, uh, will you be able to, to get the talents that you will need to be successful into the company um, at, at the right time? Uh, so there are a few risks involved there as well. Thank you, Oliver. I'd like to ask you a question that we have from the audience because I think it's quite linked to the discussion we have is, uh, do you think that we will see quantum companies IPO earlier than uh, standard VC-backed uh, tech companies similar to biotech companies? I think this, the jury is still out on this one. Um, <laughs> I, I can imagine it, yes, because ultimately when you go to the capital markets, uh, everything will be, or much will be about storytelling, right? So ultimately, if, if you're still in the process toward getting to the market, um, the better the news that you can you know, communicate, the more you will be liked by the capital markets. Uh, so that's the one thing. But ultimately, you will have to deliver something. And yeah. um, if you will not be able to deliver in the long run, then your IPO will maybe be successful early on and you will have an increase in valuation as you go. But if you won't be able to deliver, then that will plummet eventually. Mm -hmm. um, quite on the contrary, if you will be able to deliver, that might still rise and you will be a very successful listed uh, company in, in, at one time. But um, it's really hard to say if it makes sense 
in, in that regard. But uh, coming back to your analogy about biotech companies, I think it is similar with biotech companies, right? Because they are still in their development stage. Um, and as they progress, they always, you know, give out news about what the clinical studies look like. And if it's good news, then obviously the stocks will rise. Um, and if it's not so good, they will fall. Um, so there is a certain analogy to that. Um, and if it will be successful eventually, that uh, is something that the that time will tell. Yeah, yeah. I think the other other, other uh, thing worth noting is that if you look at the uh, makeup of quantum startups, uh, and I think it's, this is even more true for Europe than in the U.S. Because in the U.S. you have, or I should say, North America, if you look at companies like Zapata, One Qubit, uh, QCWare, you do have some level of uh, leadership in the company from the business side, mm -hmm. uh, either serial entrepreneurs or former founders. Uh, my observation is in Europe, it is very much heavily indexed towards researchers, PhDs coming out of academia. So then if you think about the idea of having an IPO, clearly the journey of a company, you know, it's not just hey, we have a product, we were showing value, but it's also the makeup of the teams that will take that company, you know, to the level of maturity that they'll actually be able to IPO. And I think what we're seeing, you know, to Oliver's point is it's still very early in terms of the talent pool the kinds of uh, employees you find in quantum computing startups. Uh, so that's also another consideration for you know, maturity and being able to even think about things like uh, an IPO. Thanks, Samir. Yeah, adding to that, uh, I'd say uh, also I'll get to that point. I think out of our 12 investments, I think 10 companies are spin-offs from universities, so a large majority of them. So to, to your point, Samir, I think there's uh, um, yeah, there's going to be a lot of, uh, of work uh, from the team, from the management team, transitioning from the lab to, a, to an early stage startup and then to a sizable company. And that's where I think uh, we investors can help or that's part of a job. That's a question. That's a point I'd like to elaborate to uh, exactly in the role of investors and the way they can support uh, companies. And uh, Samir, I'd like to ask you a question about um, do you think that investors should have a background in uh, in quantum science, whatever, regardless the science, the, the field, in order to be able to support and help their company, or that it's actually not necessary because the the need and the support that you can provide is probably outside of of pure technology. Yeah, so it's it's a great question. I think uh, you know certainly having passion and enthusiasm for the space and and. Uh, Taking the time to understand it uh, at a at a I mean obviously you're not you don't expect your investors to all have PhDs in quantum computing, mm. but if you can understand it at a deep enough level to understand you know the nuances of the field, I think that's very helpful. But you know as I look at uh, just take Psi Quantum and you, you know we the other investors being Founders Fund, Redpoint, um, uh, Playground, and N12, you know none of the the, the folks were on the board. Uh, our PhDs in quantum computing. So mm -hmm. the expertise and the value add that they bring is really on the organizational side. It's in developing a business, it's in hiring, uh, it's in understanding how to manage capital, how to go and raise the next round and making sure that, you know, the company is on a trajectory to understand, you know, uh, the cycles of development and what they need to show so that they can successfully go and raise their next round. And that's really where you know investors are adding value and are expected to add value at this stage. Um, of course, if there are investors that are very deep in the field and have you know advanced degrees, then they there is an impedance match between the engineering organization and the investor to have you know very very open and uh, direct conversations about the state of the technology. But I don't think that's actually required for investors to add value. Okay, uh, Christoph, I think you you want to elaborate on that. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, I've got a PhD in quantum physics, uh, postdoc as well. I think I'm, I'm in the category of uh, scientists turned, uh, after some time, investors. I, I completely agree with Samir. I think you don't need to have this background, but you need to, to gather and have the experts uh, who will help you assess uh, the technology, especially the, the maturity in order to validate the roadmap. I think what I've learned spending years in the lab in the dark with my lasers is that uh, quantum physics is hard. Uh, and I think it gives you a different perspective when somebody comes and tells you it's going to build a universal quantum computer in five years. Uh, I think, yeah, fine, interesting. Uh, but I don't think it makes, uh, makes a lot of sense. Uh, but you don't need to be a scientist, of course, to, 
to, to have this, um, this kind of uh, assessment, but you need to gather uh, the top talents, uh, top uh, scientists around you to, to do the due diligence. It's not like other sectors where you find relatively easily the people to do the due diligence. In quantum physics, quantum science, it's relatively hard. The pool of experts is limited. Uh, and I think that's one of the problems in the sector of limitations that we're all facing in assessing the, the technologies, uh, the, uh, the maturity and the startups. I think that's a really, really good point, which is, you know, if you look at, if you compare it to the AI field, uh, the talent is way more constrained at this at this stage. Uh, and so then what expertise can you lean on to give you a calibrated perspective about the claims that a startup may be making on where they are in terms of development and what the end game is and when they'll be able to achieve it. Uh, and so I think being able to have access and lean on reputable experts uh, that are known in the field to give you that opinion. I think that's really important. Now, you could certainly, you know, if you're, if you're Christoph, you can do that yourself. Uh, if you're others, you have to lean on a set, a set of experts uh, to be able to do that. Thank you. So it moves to the next point that I'd like to uh, discuss with you. It's about talent, because I think it's, uh, it's key, especially in this, uh, such a particular field. Um, so um, I'd like to uh, um, go back to what you said, Samir, about the fact that in the US, uh, you, we, you tend to see companies where business profiles are, are very early on in the company, whereas in Europe, um, teams are mostly um, researchers that are spin-offing uh, technology. That's also what we see uh, in our accelerator uh, deep tech founders, mostly researchers turning entrepreneur. Um, so now I'd like to direct the, the question to you, Oliver. Um, so do you always expect people with a business profile uh, to be in a team uh, since inception? Or do you also accept teams that are only with, uh, with people with technical backgrounds? Um, and, um, and what are the kind of teams that you look like, uh, that you would like to have in, in quantum technologies? Um, are they different than, uh, than other teams or, or it's the usual suspects? Um, that's, that's a really good question. So. Um... It always helps to have a business person on board with tech startups. Um, reason being, um, technologists love technology just by, by the pure definition. And, um, and that's great and good, but you eventually have to turn your technology into a prototype, into an MVP, and eventually into a product, and then you will have to bring that to the market. And so um, the, the requirements uh, in terms of staff and personnel and talent change as a, a company develops, right? So that's, that's more or less generic. That's true for every startup. So initially you will need the, the technologists, but then eventually we need the people from marketing and sales to get the products into the market. And as the company grows, you will eventually come to a point where the organization is so large that you need people that will have an, an operative angle, an operational angle on the company to, to be able to keep the, the company together and um, organize it in a structured way. Um, now that, that's true for every company with, um, Quantum tech, um, again, also with biotech, it's, I think it's a very good analogy, really. Um, that is a little bit different because you're in a development stage for a really, really long time. And marketing and sales don't necessarily become important at an early stage. Hmm. They may become important at one point, but early on, you don't really need those people. But at the same time, you do need a business perspective because ultimately you want to produce a product, right? Something that you want to sell that you need to have a clear vision for what the target market is, what the target application is, what are the actual metrics that matter, what are the unit economics that could potentially play out for you to be profitable in the end. Um, so that is important to understand. Now, do you need a, a business person in terms of somebody with, a, with an MBA or some degree in, in, in a business related field? Not necessarily, because um, that is, um, I think, something that a good scientist will be able to handle himself, but you need that perspective, definitely. Yeah. Thank you, Oliver. Um, so I, I'll try to uh, just move on so I see that the clock is ticking. And, and um, um, Samir, you, you mentioned one thing about uh, machine learning a couple of, of minutes ago. Um, so I think the quantum field is even smaller than, than the, the people who are in ML. So maybe one tenth uh, or, or even one hundred. So, as as you have quite a long experience in uh, startups that are that are in the ML field, can you maybe share with us some uh, insights and feedback on 
how to not reproduce the same mistakes that that most of the people did uh, in the machine learning field in terms of talent and uh, and uh, having people be able to jump on board on, on startups. Yeah, so I, I think one one uh, uh, one scenario I hope does not replay in the quantum space that we've seen in the AI and machine learning space is uh, you know at, as machine learning took off and there was this hunt for talent, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the academic labs got raided. Uh, and, you know, very smart researchers, new uh, people entering the field, you know, it's, it's hard not to be enticed by the compensation that industry can offer versus being in academia. Um, now, the, the downside of that is if you have everyone rushing to industry, you know, where are the next generation of researchers, the next generation of uh, breakthroughs that are openly available to everyone right out of the gate? Where are those going to come from? Um, and so I hope that we don't see the same thing happening in the quantum space. There should be a balance between people going into industry and ongoing open research happening in academia to advance the field on all fronts. So I think there's a lesson to be learned there, which is, you know, uh, making sure that, you know, despite a lot of interest from industry, that we don't discourage people from continuing their academic journeys and academic careers. So that's one. I think the other one that we should pay attention to is, once a field starts to get a lot of commercial attention, then the other uh, result is, you know, you do have a very strong talent constraint and that's causing, uh, you know, uh, hyper competitiveness and recruiting that talent. And so how do you get ahead of that? How do you make sure that the talent pipeline in terms of the people graduating from university or coming out of programs with the appropriate degrees, uh, that there's enough of them? Um, and so I think when we think about a quantum workforce, and we think about people that will be able to program quantum computers, uh, will be able to do workload exploration, have the ability to connect the dots and seeing, you know, hey, I understand what a quantum Fourier transform is, but I'm going to now uh, figure out how to apply that to a completely different field than what's been done before. That kind of algorithmic thinking, I think, uh, requires a generational shift in being exposed to the fundamentals of quantum information science not necessarily having to become a quantum physicist to understand that, but if you understand the rules of entanglement, of teleportation, of superposition, at a information level, you should hopefully then be able to come up with uh, new ideas of how to use those things to solve algorithmic problems. Uh, so one of my uh, you know, favorite ideas is something proposed by John Preskill, which is the idea of quantum games. And you can imagine if young people and even children are exposed to those, they may form some form of instinct about thinking about algorithms from a quantum perspective, which today, you know, yes, we, we don't have very many people like Peter Shore uh, or Grover that can come up with fundamentally new algorithms. But I think if you expose people to the, the core ideas early on, we should be able to see people coming up with innovative ways of uh, applying those principles to new use cases. Thank you. Um, I think one way maybe to solve this problem of talents and uh, make sure that we have enough people that understand uh, everything that is at stake is probably by building ecosystems that um, allows building new people and, and also people being exposed to uh, use cases and, and discuss from different fields because even people that are in hardware in quantum computing may not necessarily be able to talk to people that are in software or um, people that are in doing materials that are used for, for quantum computing. Um, so maybe I'd like to ask Christoph. Um, because you, you initiated the lab quantique. So what do you expect from um, ecosystems and accelerator so as to help fuel new companies and even research labs because you cannot spin off anything uh, if you don't have a very good research uh, at the at the basic of the company. Uh, Christophe, your mic is uh, switched off. Again, uh, yeah, so, so we created the, the, the not-for-profit lab quantique that hosts us today precisely to build bridge between uh, academia and the end users, uh, position us, uh, ourselves downstream. And I think that's uh, where we need to, to focus our efforts. And that's where uh, startups, investors, and community can help also uh, build the quantum industry. I think while there, there are, there were initiatives already in the universities, uh, we felt that there was something missing there. Uh, that's uh, what we try to build. There are other initiatives that are also excellent, this perspective, the, the CDL in Toronto, Creative Destruction Lab, I'm a part of, uh, is, a, is an institution uh, that is very open 
uh, that helps also build the community, gives the ceiling. The initiative in Sherbrooke, in, uh, in Quebec, uh, so we talked about Q2, I think it was um, four weeks ago. Uh, also, it's about building the, the bridge between uh, academia and the industry. So I think this is a, a core part of, the, uh, of what we should do, uh, really building these connections. Uh, it's really important. And the lab, through these events that we are having today, I think is, uh, is trying to do that. So it's an example, uh, but I think we will build together. And it's really important in this case uh, that we don't build fortresses. It's really early in the, in the, in the play for quantum technologies. Uh, it's really important to develop open source initiatives, for example, uh, share the news, share, uh, share the ideas. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's uh, absolutely necessary and we're on the right track, uh, probably, but uh, we need to put some more efforts into it. Um, also, the connections between Europe and the US is, are also very important because uh, these technologies are important for sovereignty. Uh, that's quite clear to everybody. Uh, but we need to, to keep the connections and, and not uh, close the, the borders. I think that's a, that's a challenge. It's going to be a challenge, in particular for quantum computing. Thank you, Christophe. So I hope that uh, this uh, also answered to Bombardier's question that will be how European VC can uh, keep brains in Europe. So maybe by building and, and supporting uh, local ecosystems also where, where startups can, can thrive. Um, we have a question from uh, Amanda Stein, which which I want, which is the very common with the last question that I wanted to ask you. So Amanda's question is, um, uh, what are the promise in companies that are not in quantum computing, but rather sensing and networking materials? And what advices do you have for companies uh, like that? And uh, and uh, for me, it resonates with the last question that I wanted to ask you is, uh, uh, if 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 I was if I were in, in a position to grant you a wish. Um, what would be the breakthrough, the technological breakthrough? Of course, I'm not in this position, so, but at least I have your feedback. So uh, what would be uh, you, the, the breakthrough that you'd like to see uh, in quantum technology in the two, two, three coming years? <laughs> would like to answer first. Uh, I, I can take a stab at it. I think, uh, yeah. you know, we're all hopeful to see systems uh, that are scaled up to uh, 100 plus physical qubits. Uh, and I think we should see that maybe in the next one to two years. Uh, so that would be one interesting development that kind of shows, you know, incremental progress uh, towards larger and larger systems. Now, clearly from there, there, there are, you know, two different tracks. One, one set of, uh, one philosophy is to think about modular systems where you take these hundred plus qubit systems and then you, you tile them together to ultimately create uh, a larger machine. And of course, the other campus is say, you know what, we're going to go for a truly uh, scaled up system on the order of you know, hundreds of thousands of qubits or millions of qubits, but not necessarily relying on uh, a truly modular approach on the order of a few hundred qubits and, and, and trying to tile that. Thank you, Samia. For, for once, uh, for, yeah, sorry. Uh, Christopher, you go. Sorry. Yeah, for, for once, Roberta, we said, I would say this is not a good question. Uh, <laughs> just to start with. Uh, no, I, I really don't believe in silver bullet in, the, in this field. I think we should uh, all be cautious about that. What I'm, I'm really uh, excited about is see all these new companies, early stage, uh, being born just now or last year, transitioning from uh, proof of concept to commercial product, uh, from uh, prototype to industrialized. Uh, and also going through the, the various rounds of funding. And that would be exciting because there are many companies start, starting just right now, especially in Europe, uh, who, has maybe, who have started also last year, maybe 10, 20, even 30. And they will all go through this. And it's going to be super exciting, very interesting to see how they do this transition through these complicated times also due to COVID-19, obviously. Uh, but what, that's what I, uh, I look forward to. Uh, great success for all of them, or most of them, of course. Uh, and I think it's going to be really, really super exciting to see that. And no other technology, no other sector uh, will witness this kind of uh, development uh, of a new technology. Thank you, Gustav. And Oliver? I, I think I'm, a, I mean, it, it's hard to, to really gauge that. Uh, because when I think about what, what the world looked like five years ago, I would have never imagined what the world now looks like, right? So the development has been so rapid over the last few years and uh, the, the breakthroughs are really just um, extraordinary. So it's really hard to gauge what the world will look like in two to three years. But at the same time, there are obviously multiple contenders, technological contenders that is um, on route towards a quantum computer. And I'm focusing solely on quantum computing right now. 
Um, obviously, there is sensing communication and so forth, but this all is related uh, on a component level anyway. Um, so what I would like to see um, is um, some degree of indication about scalability, because currently we have notions about what systems will be the prevalent systems for specific um, applications. So for quantum computing, everybody, uh, well, well, there is the notion that necessarily everybody thinks that, but there is the notion that um, uh, superconducting qubits will be the easiest to scale. Um, now that's a thesis at the moment, um, which I tend to concur with, but again, it's, it's really early to make such an assessment. So if I had one wish, I would really, and this is perhaps also a little bit the investor inside me speaking, I would really like to wish which one has the best potential to scale uh, to a large number of qubits, to a really expansive network um, for, for communication purposes. Um, yeah, that, that is something that I'm really curious about. So if you could tell me that, I'd be very happy. As I mentioned at the beginning, it was just for discussion, <laughs> the sake of discussion. Uh, we'll we'll thank, continue this discussion in private later. <laughs> yeah, it will be my pleasure. Thank you very much for, for all your feedbacks and, and insights. Uh, it was a very great panel. Uh, thanks again. No, unfortunately, nobody can clap for to applause, but I'm quite sure that everyone was mm -hmm. very happy, very happy to, to hear you. Um, we still have some, uh, some open questions, so don't hesitate to uh, answer through uh, the Q&A, through the chat. Um, and now I will leave the floor to uh, Enrique, who uh, will, uh, is the CEO of uh, IQM Germany and uh, will give his talk on co-design quantum computer. Enrique, the floor is yours. I think your, your mic is uh, switched off. Merci bien, Robert. I'm going to speak in English, don't worry. <laughs> um, so you see my screen? Uh, not yet. Wait a second. Yes, now we see okay. it. Okay, and now you should see it white, right? Let me take a couple of seconds. Yes. Yes. Okay, great. <clears throat> so uh, thanks a lot. Merci bien à tout, uh, tout le monde. Uh, I, I, long time that I don't speak French. That's what I was felt me tempted to do, to do the introduction. Um, so um, I am uh, Enrique Solano, uh, CEO of IQM Germany, a subsidiary company of IQM uh, based in Helsinki, Finland. And uh, we uh, opened our operations um, uh, a couple of months ago, 1st of March, in a one-way move uh, because of all the problems of uh, transport and traveling that you know. But we are already very glad uh, working heavily uh, and, and happily from Munich, uh, boosting um, a, a kind of a renewed approach that uh, we call co-design quantum computers. And I will comment also some of the issues that were raised in the panel. Huh? So I think there are uh, several uh, misleading concepts. Uh, number of qubits is not a measure for us, or it should not be. It's not something that we don't recommend. Digital quantum computers are not the time to boost in the way it is boosted. To develop quantum algorithms, expecting that there is a universal scalable error corrected digital quantum computer it's a fantasy that is useless for the next decades. And that there are certainly ways of uh, developing um, a quantum advantage uh, in the next few years if we just uh, learn uh, from the history of, of technology <clears throat> and we abandon a, a kind of uh, a mystic principles as universality, digital, uh, uh, and instead of uh, just trying to copy the history of classical computing, we go and read and breathe through the possibilities of the quantum platforms and quantum hardware now, be in trapped ions, be in superconducting circuits, photons, uh, quantum dots, uh, or the like. And we really go towards um, uh, implementing quantum computers, quantum simulators with uh, uh, quantum hardware and quantum software hand in hand. So that's more or less the topic of my, of my speech today. 
and I hope you like it because I will try to contradict more or less everything people think about it. So that's it. So uh, first of all, a small definition of what we call co-design quantum computers. I have prepared these definitions because I have been a professor for decades and I love definitions. So I, but I can change it tomorrow, don't worry. So it is a, a quantum processor built with state-of-the-art quantum hardware. That means we never go to the labs and to tell the guys, look, I have a wonderful algorithm that solves the problem of black holes or financial crashes or chemistry problems for drug design and the COVID-19 will be solved uh, uh, next century. So this is not the way we work. Uh, we go to the labs and we understand pretty well how the system works. I have done, I have designed the first and the unique uh, two qubit gate that is still used in trap ions. I have designed many gates and many operations and superconducting circuits and photons. So we understand pretty well. We are kind of people that come from the theory side that understand pretty well the hardware. And I can tell you that uh, there are ways of reaching quantum advantage now and in the next few years, if you just give up in some, uh, as I said, mysterious uh, metaphysical principles that are we are uh, requesting to, to the platforms. So state of the art quantum hardware, but um, we uh, design them in such a way that they perform optimally with client requested quantum software, which means a set of not one, but a set of and a class, a large class of possibilities for quantum software, be for financial uh, models, be for chemistry problems, be for material design, be for machine learning uh, uh, and fluid dynamics, as we like to mention, and so on. So um, another prejudice, in our opinion, um, is that what people people speak when people say you go to the street. Now you cannot go to the street very frequently, but let's say. You go to the street and you say quantum computers, everybody thinks they understand and they mean these digital quantum algorithms implemented in these architectures, which is rather restricted. And that's not the state of the art uh, for us. Uh, NISC architectures are just boring uh, square cells of nearest neighbor couple qubits uh, with no error correction because the overhead of physical qubits is insane. Uh, and that's just, uh, uh, then on top of this, we take this, what we call NISC architectures, and we try to implement digital quantum algorithms, which is the worst possible match between a NISC architecture and, and a quantum algorithm. And that's where we are, investing millions and billions in what we think it's not the moment in the history to do. And just as an example, I will mention digital analog quantum computing is uh, um, something that we have been developing in the last 10 years. Um, of course, uh, in the shadow, because uh, the, the high tech companies have decided to, to give this mandate of the digital approach uh, where they can survive like that uh, 20, 30, 40, 50 years or one century because this doesn't affect their budgets. But any effort from Europe or other parts of the planet uh, with uh, budgets of tens or hundreds of millions should go for a more original, original approach, shortcutting the, the path towards quantum advantage, as I will explain briefly. So that's more or less what we are uh, looking for with this digital analog quantum computing and these co-design quantum computers, trying to make the quantum winter uh, reduce to zero. I mean, I will not live a single year under the quantum winter, and there are plenty of clever ideas uh, that are born in Europe uh, and that uh, should have to be boosted, uh, should be boosted in Europe and uh, very soon copied and mimicked in US and in China and not the opposite as we are seeing now. So um, that's a, a, fair, um, a slide that shows uh, briefly the idea of the digital analog paradigm that we developed. Um, by the way, uh, we are always thinking that we discover things, right? But uh, even the Greek philosophers would tell us that we are only rediscovering uh, and a student showed me a paper of the 50s, I guess, whose title was Digital Analog Computing, something like that, an old version. So even, even in the history of conventional classical computing, there was a moment where, where, where digital analog were mixed. And in fact, if you check what was put in the, in the chips for going to the moon, they were mostly analog combined with some digital steps. So this is just the natural way of reading history. So the idea in this digital analog is to establish, a, a, let's say, a set of qubits or a, that could be extended to qubits or to other devices, could be harmonic oscillators, a open transmission line for continuing of sonic modes, fermionic atoms, if you want to use atoms and so on. So let's say, uh, as you see in the lower sentence, uh, we follow closely the, the, the philosophy of Feynman uh, which is that instead of forcing your system to manifest like qubits, you respect the quantum complexity that is naturally inbuilt 
the open transmission lines, like the continuum homosonic modes, the fermions, the qubits, the cavities, and so on. And we call just digital steps, uh, uh, one or two qubit gates that are just applied on the systems, on the qubits. And we call analog blocks via a discrete or continuous representation of the original system that we want to mimic or compute, or also multi-qubit evolutions with a continuous parameter that is a time. That, is, that means a continuous gates, if you want to call them like that. And in the combination of that, we have proved recently, there is a paper 2020 in Physical Review A, titled Digital Analog Quantum Computation, where we have proof that if you wanted, this, is, this paradigm is also universal, but we have not built it to be universal. We just wanted to prove that it's universal uh, to shut up some colleagues that were saying, oh, it's so specific, so limited, so restricted. So essentially, it is universal uh, as any other uh, digital algorithm nowadays without error correction. And um, uh, we have been showing some applications that we will describe now. So um, the first one is just a small uh, publicity. It's a paper also in the archive with Frank Wilhelm and some people from Mercedes-Benz um, and Spain, where we just applied for the QAOA algorithm that some people have been mentioning. We have proof that if you follow um, the digital analog quantum computing paradigm, you can do better with the same NISC architecture uh, as I mentioned before, I mean, you take any chip of Google or of IBM and just following this recipe, you will do better, you will go farther in the quantum volume and you will save coherence time. We have kind of two versions, but it's not meant to be a very technical talk, but we have a kind of a sequential and stepwise approach or also what we call the bang bang approach where we run the analog block and we start to kick it. Uh, very fast with local uh, uh, operations like it is possible nowadays in big with laser beams on atoms or on superconducting circuits as we are doing in IQM uh, in hardware. Then um, I'm very happy because today um, our great friend and probably arguably the, the best experimentalist in Europe, uh, uh, the lab of Andreas Valgaf uh, in the academic world in, in Etehad Zurich, uh, they put a paper together with one of the founders of Circuit UED, uh, our friend Alexandre Roblet from Sherbrooke University. They put this paper where they uh, improved this uh, uh, performance of the QAOA again and using what they call a continuous of gate sets. And if you check Twitter, they even agree that this is just a small case of what we call digital analog quantum computation. And they prove, as you see in the lower lines of the abstract, this is a paper of today, that they can go much farther and do much better. They still call it in the NISC architectures, but as I will mention uh, later, we can do better and improve easily the NISC architectures while uh, not changing at all the technology and not requesting more than, than what is available. But that's a nice example also that we can go on. So the co-design strategy, we have separated in our company uh, in, in three levels. Uh, this is thought mostly for our partners and clients. So the level one is we take just the NISC architectures that are available and we prove that digital analog quantum algorithms can do better, as I explained. In a level two, uh, once you are more convinced of level one, you can just say, man, if I have designed NISC architectures for one and two qubit gates, why I don't optimize architecture with specs that fit better the digital analog paradigm? And that's what we did uh, and we can do. And uh, then we will build uh, enhanced uh, uh, architectures that match better and can go farther uh, than the results that I have previously showed. In level three, this is the most advanced, just to shortcut the message. We go to the clients, a client said, oh, I want the black skulls equations for financial models, or I want the turbulent regime of the Navier-Stokes equation for fluid dynamics or I want a model of nuclear uh, reactions for avoiding making explosions in the islands of the Pacific Ocean. And then we will deconstruct these uh, uh, models and these uh, mathematical abstractions towards the architecture so that we are able to create um, uh, geometries, topologies, and algorithms and software where uh, the hardware and the software will speak the same language and we will be able to reach quantum advantage uh, faster. So many people say, look, the, um, the result of Google last year, 53 qubits, prove that the path of digital error-corrected quantum computer is correct. Uh, sorry to disagree. It's exactly the opposite. What has been proved last year is that you don't need error correction and you don't need anything else uh, to go ahead and to reach quantum advantage and usefulness. What you need is a correct mapping of hardware and software hand in hand. So um, um, you can read it very fast. I think that my time will be very short. 
Um, so, so there are advantages, of course. Uh, we want to go further. We want to reach quantum advantage. We don't want to work for posterity. We don't want that our grandsons and, and, and daughters are saying, wow, my, my grandfather did it. Uh, no, we want quantum advantage now, usefulness now. And we want to shine with clever ideas from Europe towards uh, Europe, uh, towards US, towards North America, and towards Asia in an in a, in a original and uh, distinct way. And just to finish, um, this is the, the co-design strategy that we have designed in the company, and we will be working on that since Munich and also since Helsinki. As you see, uh, for us, when we say quantum computer is a perfect matching between hardware and software with a, single, with a specific purpose, uh, of course, we have our co-design levels one and uh, two and three for our collaborators, research-like partners that will accompany us and clients that will want to buy directly a quantum computer because we are fabricate and build and sell quantum computers. Uh, in the upper part, we have also education and research because we think that there are many, many uh, um, uh, useful uh, cases for education and research that can be built like a quantum MATLAB chip, for example, like applications for developing research uh, papers for theoretical quantum physicists. So chips and computers that are suited for making the calculations that nowadays we do with classical computers. For that, we don't need really such a, a wonderful supremacy. And below you see recreation and outreach. This is an idea that was not original from John Plesky clearly, but we are saying this since 10 years that the applications to games and quantum maps, not only for games, but in the same way that Volkswagen has done with D-Wave, um, apps that are just uh, 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 training the people, for example, with financial models, financial crashes, and we have the pioneer works in applications of quantum computing to finance since last year, and also dissemination modules for, for, for education, where, as I always say in the social networks, it's not the decision whether we want to teach quantum computing to children. Children will be teaching us quantum computer faster and better than we can ever imagine. Okay, so the, the examples, um, I don't know how many minutes I have. Uh, you five still have uh, <clears throat> yeah, five to 10 minutes. So Okay, yeah. five to 10. I'll try to wrap up. Then the, the, the examples I was already giving, uh, we have, for example, results of digital analog quantum Fourier transform. Uh, not only for short algorithm, but for phase estimation and from phase estimation for quantum chemistry, the QAOA we have developed also, and we can enhance it with a more level three co-design where the chip will be even uh, stronger to host it. Uh, we have developed and are developing key results for digital analog quantum algorithms for financial and behavioral economics models. And the co-design uh, for fluid dynamics, logistic networks, chemistry and machine learning. And, and as, as I said, we are approaching to the clients, the clients are presenting their needs, and we are just deconstructing and trying to build the best chip and the best software hand in hand to reach quantum advantage we've built for. It is not true that we need thousands or millions of qubits uh, to, to, to reach quantum advantage. That's the, the, the typical mistaken approach because we are thinking like in conventional computers. The same, market, the same technology, with a different architecture and a different software mentality should prove that in the same way that Google could make it quantum advantage with 53 qubits, with 53, 75, or 200 quantum elements, we should be able to reach quantum advantage for useful problems without any difficulty, in my opinion. And that's what we are working heavily on that, to show that from Europe, we can shortcut and reduce the quantum winter to, to almost nothing. So this is just a fast uh, uh, publicity. You see, we have some papers in prediction of financial crashes that we developed pioneer, pioneer work of last year in a D-Wave quantum computer. Also, we developed logistic network in an optimization model. Uh, we developed the concept of quantum artificial life, which shows that we can also play with the quantum computers uh, following Darwinian laws and creating notions of life, we have to create the notion of partial quantum cloning to, over, to overtake the problem of the quantum cloning for uh, mimicking the DNA behavior. It was a, a very successful paper. We also created the concept of quantum memory stores uh, that would be the basis of neuromorphic quantum technologies that along this spirit of the co-design, if you want to imitate, for example, memory-based intelligent smart devices uh, uh, that learn, nothing is better than to use building blocks that are already uh, um, quantum, dissipative, memory-based, and non-Markovian. 
and that's more or less the, the idea that we have uh, very soon to create a concept of the quantum brain that is our, our scope. And I will just end up with this uh, diagram that I, um, that I leave there for your consideration, where we have more or less uh, uh, our business plan around for trying to develop quantum computers with this co-design strategy. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Enrique. It was a very, very interesting, very insightful. And I especially like the fact that uh, that you took into into account the entire ecosystem and um, in order to to achieve some results. And that's something uh, most of the startups um, tend to forget that they are not alone and uh, they need an entire ecosystem to succeed in their uh, in their journey. So, thank you and 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 congratulations for taking it into account uh, all all actors of um, of the ecosystem. Yeah. Um, uh, maybe one interesting question from uh, we just had um, that you can answer to everyone because there are others. Um, how difficult was it for you to transit from a professor to leading a startup in the quantum industry? Wow, what a philosophical question, Robert. Yeah, uh, but it's very it's interesting. A very interesting question. Yeah, it's a very interesting question. In fact, um, I, if you see even the websites of my previous, uh, I was director. Of a center, I'm still am uh, I'm still are in, in in Bilbao, Spain, and also in Shanghai University, a center in quantum artificial intelligence. I always felt me first an artist, then a scientist, then an engineer, then a businessman, an entrepreneur, uh, never a philosopher. And and uh, I think that uh, um, I learn a lot going frequently to the Silicon Valley and going to these places where you cannot feel the difference. Really, it is just the human being using their brain and their wishes. So I just was looking for an opportunity until I got a fantastic offer from IQM. Uh, I lived already in Munich many years. I was in Max Planck Institute. Then I just, I, you know, life is only one. And I wanted to know what is the feeling of collaborating with great people trying to build from Europe quantum computers. But as I said, with original ideas done at home and not just trying to follow uh, uh, like is the current trend in this moment. So that's more or less the message. Thank you very much, Enrique. Thank you a lot. Um, and we'll, we'll go to the last, but uh, not the uh, least uh, speaker today, Mehdi. Um, I'm very happy to have you today, Mehdi, because actually uh, quantum networks was uh, one of the subject of my PhD quite 10 years ago. So seeing uh, companies in, in this film is uh, always fill my heart with joy. So Mehdi, I leave you the floor and thank you very much also for your talk. Awesome. We always also get very excited when we see new companies in quantum communication field. Uh, do you guys see my screen and hear me well? Yes, perfect. Perfect. Awesome. So first of all, thank you very much for inviting us here. I'm very excited. We are a very big fan of these meetups. Uh, so far, one of the best things to look forward, especially during these uh, pandemics. And it's uh, in, it, this is the last talk, so I'll try to make it as short as possible. I usually fail, so don't get too excited, but I'll do my best. Uh, we've been having many very awesome talks so far from different companies and scientists talking about quantum computing, how you can use quantum in order to enhance the way you process uh, information. I feel like you guys are getting too good at quantum computing. So now I want to redirect the conversation a little bit and talk about another aspect of uh, quantum information, what else you can use quantum for in this case for enhancing the way we transfer information, these methods are generally known as uh, quantum communication. Now for the application of quantum communication and quantum networking, probably the first thing that comes to anyone's mind is QKD, quantum key distribution, a method to securely transfer a secret key between two or multiple parties and to know with very high accuracy whether there was an eavesdropper there, whether this key is secure or not. Now, I want to talk a little bit about this, although the focus of the conversation is not gonna be on QKD, is that QKD is usually known as a technology that answers the side effect of quantum computers. When it comes with, with great uh, power comes great responsibility. If you have exponential processing power, you are having these side effects of not having secure networks because of the way RSA codes work. So everyone sees QKD as a method to defeat this problem or to solve this problem of quantum computers. In reality, there are two very important aspects to know about uh, quantum encryption and quantum secure networking. One is that this is not a technology that you need 
30, 40 years from now to protect yourself against quantum computers. This is a technology you need now in order to protect yourself a decade, a few decades from now uh, against quantum computer or any other computational technique that has exponential power compared to, dig to digital. Because all of us have data that the privacy of this data is important over long term. In our case, it's usually our health, for example, information. And for governments and agencies, it's usually the classified data that they have that is very important to keep the privacy over several decades. So you don't want your information now get hacked easily 20 years from now and be used against you. The other thing is that QKD is not a technology for the future because it can answer a couple of very important flaws in the way we secure keys right now in uh, digital communication. To name the two of the most important ones is first the accuracy. If you get hacked now, whether it's you or the US government or any agency, it usually takes between three hours to years before you even know you got hacked. Most of the times you actually see it on WikiLeaks or something and then you realize you were hacked. QKD comes with this promise of 100% accuracy in uh, detecting uh, cyber threats. Of course, uh, implementation wise, you never reach the 100%, but the numbers are very different than what you can expect from digital. The other thing is that how fast you can detect that you've been uh, getting hacked. It, it takes a while now, but uh, but with QKD, you can bring these numbers below seconds instead of weeks or days waiting to know you got hacked. You can do this in a microsecond or a few microseconds. You know you're getting hacked. Real-time hack uh, cyber threat detection is essential for so many businesses, for example, to secure power grids or like swift transactions between banks because there every second translates to millions, if not billions of dollars in financial transactions. Now, QKD aside, of course, a very big long-term importance of quantum networking comes through the concept of distributed quantum computing, a word that I want to actively avoid today, quantum internet, because we are far, far away from it. But it is very important to know that, of course, it's awesome to build quantum computers. But if you cannot connect them to each other, you are eventually limited on how much you can leverage the power of quantum computing. That's why now many companies, like we had talks here from Orca, Quantum Computing, SciQuantum, Xanadu, the new Harvard MIT company, uh, Quantum Era. These are companies that are coming to because they want to bring uh, optical and atomic quantum computing in, uh, in a commercialized way because they understand that not only optics and optical systems and atomic systems bring leverages right now, it's very, very easy to scale them up and plug them into a network over like telecom fibers and things to connect quantum computers to each other. Of course, quantum networking comes with a lot of other advantages, a couple of more I just named here. Uh, you can use them for if you can distribute entanglement between different quantum sensors or between different uh, telescope arrays, you can achieve, for example, resolutions that are impossible right now for astronomy, or you can achieve precisions that are now impossible for uh, anything, in, including uh, gravity meters, magnetometers, and any technology uh, like this. So quantum networking, at least to my belief, will become one of the very essential techno technologies in the future. And like any other technology, it came with its evolution. So I'm just gonna talk about two uh, different generations. And then in the next slide, I'll tell you why I separate these into generations. One is the direct qubit transmission. Yeah, So you literally grab a fiber or a free space and send your qubits uh, to the other party between Alice and Bob, for example. These are qubits, these are photons that you can encode on them information through a uh, superposition. So you can assure the security of your networks because pretty much nature does the job for you. The anti-commuting uh, relationships stops anyone from reading your qubits without uh, being able to, uh, without failing to recreate them in, in a sense. This is already been commercialized. There are companies out there. This is not that much like quantum computing that you have to wait. If you really want QKD right after this talk, if you have a very important use for it, or for some reason you have four or $500,000, you don't know what to do with it. Right after this talk, you can go online and buy yourself a QKD system. In that case, please email us first. We know we have better uses for your 500,000. Uh, and the second generation is to distribute entanglement between parties. Instead of just Alice sending something to Bob, you give Alice and Bob each one photon that are entangled to each other because now they can do use a lot of things. They can do everything uh, 
QKD related with it, but they also can use it for processing. They can have like these entangled gates, things like this. And people have done a lot of uh, very nice demonstrations, demonstration of entanglement over long distances in Canada and China. But usually it comes with one issue and the issue, especially with the fiber-based technologies, is the loss in the fiber systems. Both these technologies suffer from the problem of extending the distance because fiber loss is exponential. And the longer you go, the faster you lose the, the quantum properties you care about uh, for, for any application. This is why I call these two separate generations because the second generation distributed entangled networks gives you this uh, possibility to extend the network distance in, in a very, very nice and modular approach generally known as the uh, entanglement swapping protocols. What does entanglement swapping says? If you want Alice and Bob have each access to one entangled photon, but they're too far away from each other that you can achieve this using a fiber, instead of having one entanglement source, come and put two entanglement sources there and then ask uh, uh, two entanglement sources there and use this process of entanglement swapping. You have four photons here, Use two of those photons. Uh, let me see if I have actually a marker. Yeah, so you probably see that laser pointers. Use two of the photons from each entanglement sources to a device known as a ballasted measurement. You do a joint uh, measurement on them, which will result in entangling the two photons that you send for Alice and Bob, and you never, they never even met each other. And you can cascade this regardless of how far away Alice and Bob are from each other. You can put 10 entanglement sources, 15 entanglement sources, and you can increase the distance. The problem is that the entanglement sources and the loss in the fiber are not deterministic. So if you have uh, many entanglement sources, you never can assure that the photons are arriving at your ballasted measuring device uh, simultaneously and in a synchronized way. And if you don't have synchronized photons, this measurement is not going to work, at least not with an acceptable efficiency. In that case, you need devices in between to allow for buffering and synchronization of the networks. This is literally what Joshua and Nan last month talked about, that they want to use quantum memories to buffer uh, for quantum computing. Here, we want to use quantum memories to buffer for quantum communications to allow the synchronization of the qubits so we can have efficient ballistic measurings so you can extend the distance. Of course, if you want to go one layer further, you want to be able to use the telecom infrastructure rather than, rather than expecting everyone to go build their whole new infrastructures for quantum networking. So you want to have technologies that allow for and they, they allow to make telecom into a friendly, quantum friendly environment, one of them being frequency converters. Not all devices, not all quantum devices work at uh, telecom, for example, quantum memories and stuff like this. Uh, but the but, uh, telecom fibers are designed to be very efficient for telecom wavelengths. So it's very advantageous if you can convert the frequency of your photons into telecom frequencies and then convert them back or, or any mixture of this. Everything you see here in this picture is pretty much known as a quantum repeater. And this is pretty much the mission of QNECT and all the collaborations we have with different teams to realize this, to build all the hardware and modules necessary, not only these quantum hardwares that I'm showing you here, but also all the axillary hardwares and the softwares you need to reliably plug quantum devices into telecom networks and make it into a very friendly space for quantum information to distribute entanglement across long uh, distances. Now, uh, there are several modules here, so I'm going to start my focus and talk more about uh, the quantum memories because this is our strong suit and this is a technology we've been working on uh, for a while. Light matter interfaces that you can use them as quantum memories is not something we invented. It's been out there for uh, decades. Many, many amazing groups been working on. I like to categorize this also into different categories because we are physicists and we really like to like rank things, not rank things, but like categorize the stuff. Uh, the first category that, for example, the three examples I put here are the readout systems, the systems that you create the entanglement in your quantum device, for example, an atomic ensemble or a MD or a silicon vacancy centered systems, and then you can distribute them. The second generations, let's not use the word generation, but the second type is the in-out quantum systems or uh, light matter interfaces. In-out light matter interfaces are the ones that are capable of receiving qubits and store them, buffer them, or whatever you want to do, and then release them again. 
these are the ones being mostly followed. This is the, the last one is what I want to talk the most about, the room temperature ensembles. This is what we do, what I did mainly for my PhD at the Stony Brook University. And now uh, we're continuing it at, as QNECT on the commercialization side. And it's very, very similar to what Joshua Nunn also uh, explained that Ion Bugs did, uh, does at Oxford and now uh, Orca Computing is Doing. So now let's focus a little bit on why we care about this uh, electromagnetically induced based uh, quantum memories. Just to briefly talk about what do I mean by electromagnetically induced or EIT uh, systems. Pretty much uh, I'm talking about atoms, in this case rubidium or cesium, for example, that you can have a three level structure like this, ABC. Yeah? When you have a three level structure like this, we always tune our, our qubits to have a wavelength that creates this coupling between A and B. So if you send photons to this uh, vapor, there are billions and billions of these atoms in this vapor. So the photon is gonna get uh, absorbed because it's right on the transition, yeah? So for us, for uh, AIT gives you this power to use a control field, this omega here, and a strong laser that is tuned to the other transition, A to C. And this laser will change the transparency of the medium for your qubits. So you can make the medium transparent or dark uh, whether for your application. So this way you can use this medium uh, for storage of light at single photon level because you can make it transparent, allow the photons enters and then dark it by turning off the control field. And then anytime you want, of course, the, uh, depending on the coherence time, turn it on again. Why this is advantageous? First of all, because it works at room temperature and it works reliably at room temperature, which is a very, very important factor for what we want to do. Of course, you can make a quantum computer using cryogenic technologies because it's one computer, you put it in a lab and you're all good. But we want to develop modules that you go and put them anywhere you want on this planet. Our goal is to develop field deployable quantum hardware, including quantum memories. So pretty much nothing is gonna be a reliable uh, product for scalability unless it works at room temperature. Not only it works at room temperature, it works reliably. We can have a storage of light uh, with very minimal uh, background noise, and we can have a storage of light for long storage times. To just quickly compare, because the, the uh, Joshua Nunn's or Orca quantum computing's memories are slightly different, although the same physics, here our focus is to create a system that you can use for very long storage times because we want to synchronize the photons that are 50 to 100 kilometers or so away from each other. So we want to have a storage times of like 500 eventually to like millisecond storage times. Of course, for quantum computing, other way around, we want something that is very fast because the power of quantum computing increases if you can do it uh, fast. So we use the ground states of the atoms to allow us for this long storage time. The other advantage we have is that we can use this Dual rail, I'm not gonna get that much into of it, how it works, but we can design these dual rail quantum memories that allows for not, not only storing photons at a single photon level, but also storing the quantum information on them, which we code in terms of polarization. So here you can see a measurement from 2015 uh, that uh, we have the input polarizations of all different uh, six at a single photon level for all polarizations and the measurement of the polarization or the Pankier sphere after they've been stored. So these memories are capable of storing with fidelities above 91%. And our goal is to increase this fidelity to above 98% or so. Very, very suitable for plenty of applications in uh, quantum uh, networking, especially uh, secure communication. Now, this is been, been a long journey Everything started at Stony Brook University in Eden Figueroa's lab. It's where I did my PhD. Uh, so everything like any technology we've been talking about coming out of universities, it started on tabletops optics. We eventually, the good thing about uh, room temperature stuff is that it's very, very challenging to make them work because of the massive noise you're dealing with. But if you make it work, if you have these awesome filtering systems, it's much easier to start putting them in a box and uh, move towards uh, mass productions and scalability. In 2016, we started these collaborations with KTH. So we first, we built this, let's say first portable quantum memory that we could ship and they could work and use it in, in a collaboration in Stockholm. As you can see, I was super proud of it. Although this is pretty much the same tabletop memory that's been put on a breadboard. Uh, but then later on, 
uh, we have started making these much more uh, scalable, creating these rack months when we were at Stony Brooks. And then we, developed, we uh, founded QNECT, in which now we are making these MVPs. Hopefully, we are starting the commercialization this year, which will allow us to have this very stable uh, quantum memories. The eventual goal is to move towards a miniaturized version, which is very, very, these are all uh, mounted optics. It's a very stable system, very small. We're talking about something of uh, eight inch uh, by uh, six inch, and it allows for operations both on atomic uh, levels and telecom. While I'm talking about this, maybe I should mention this because I'm not going to talk about frequency conversions most, much. Uh, an advantage of using rubidium atoms is that rubidium has transitions at telecom wavelengths, more specifically around 300 something. So you can use the same physics, the same system in order to convert your atoms between telecom and like 795, 780 that we use for a storage. And our eventual goal is to create a memory that does both at the same time. So for example, photons come at telecom, we store them and retrieve them at 795 this time. So this allows us to have this one module that is very compatible in one side with telecom. In other side, it can does the synchronization for state measuring devices. Of course, when it comes to uh, quantum networking applications, it's not just a matter of how well individual devices work. It's a matter of how well they work together. It's very, very important because you, have, you want to have this highly efficient quantum connectivity between your devices. So we've done plenty of experiments, especially in Eden's lab, to show that you, you can achieve these uh, high quantum connectivities between quantum memory units. One of the experiments we did was in a uh, different lab. There was this Alice and Bob station capable of creating plurized qubits, uh, each of them separately. These qubits would come to our main lab there, each of them would get uh, stored in a separate quantum memory, these two in blue and red, but just much more details of the filtering system and everything. And then after retrieving them, we would do a Hungermendel measurement, an HOM measurement. HOM measurement is a very good way and a very powerful way to show quantum indistinguishability because at the end of the day, this is what matters. You want to not be able to distinguish between your qubits in a network, otherwise you start losing your quantum properties Otherwise, your ballistic measuring devices is not going to work. So we did a lot to assure that, first of all, in the plots here, what I'm showing is how identical the storage process, the EIT line gate, the classical storage for each of these memories, every single rail of these quantum memories were to each other, because it's essential, obviously, to have a perfect input-output match. And then we did this experiment using them, sending these qubits. Uh, to do a memory-assisted quantum interference uh, experiment of unsynchronized photon. As I told you, ballistic measuring or HOM measuring is not going to work if your photons are not synchronized. Here, I put these arrows. The Bob's photons were arriving around this time. Alice's photons were arriving this time. But then we use the quantum memories. These, these peaks you see are the part of the photons we couldn't store because the memories are not unitary in efficiency. But we use the quantum memories to overlap these pulses to each other. So we could do a measurement and we could show that you can achieve an HOM dip of, uh, in this case, 25.9% uh, uh, for 1.46 photons on average, 1.46 photons uh, at the beginning, not after the storage. Uh, so uh, which, which is a very a strong indication of you can achieve quantum indistinguishability using these quantum memories. I put some numbers here to uh, compare why we achieve 26%. Without memory, without anything, the max we could get at that point was 42% uh, because of the issue we had with the qubit generations and the measuring stations. Uh, you can, without having the memories, if they are unsynchronized, of course, you don't expect any visibility. I should mention that we do use uh, pulses of on average photons. So the best visibility you can get is 50%, not 100%. So 42 is pretty close. Uh, so if you had multiple photons, like 13 photons, the quantum memories could assist you to bring this visibility very, very close to the maximum you could expect from the network, in this case, uh, 42%. But if you do at a single photon level, because we also still deal with some noise, the visibility drops because the noise photons are not uh, polarized, which hurts the measuring. But this is a very big achievement for us because it shows that you can use these memories in a real application to assist a network to do a homodyne measurement in a condition that it would be impossible without the memories. Now I'm talking very fast. 
I'm about to talk even faster because it's been 22 uh, minutes that I'm talking. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what is coming next, next, next what are the things we are doing uh, right now. Everything that I'm saying I should have been much more probably clear. These are all with collaborations with the Stony Brook and now Brookhaven National Lab because Eden, my PhD advisor, he's now also a scientist at Brookhaven. So he has these two amazing facilities in each of these universities in Long Island. So the next natural step for us is to pretty much repeat the experiment that we did, sending qubits to two quantum memories and do HYM, but this time using telecom infrastructures. And we do have access to this. So we're not gonna go buy a long fiber and do experiments in a lab. We're gonna literally plug our quantum devices to the telecom infrastructures, the buried fiber in Long Island. In this case, there is a 68 kilometers fiber between the two labs uh, Edens has. And we can do this experiment. And of course, this time we want to do the frequency conversion also because 68 kilometers is already too long to send uh, near infrared lasers uh, or pulses. So we're gonna send telecom from his lab from in Brookhaven and then convert them at his lab in Stony Brook and do storage and synchronization and do the HIM measurement. The next step is to move forward and entangle two, photon, two quantum memories that are remote from each other, one of, uh, one of them in our QNX lab it's in Long Island, the other one in Brookhaven. They are significantly far away from each other. This would be the longest distance experiment done for distributing entanglement, of course, thanks to uh, the ability of using uh, quantum memories. So we are putting the entanglement sources in the stations and distribute entanglement between these uh, quantum memories. Eden is a very, very ambitious person and we really love this about it. So right now we are planning to increase these networks all the way to Rome, upstate in New York. This is very, very long distance, not gonna be achieved that easily. Uh, QNECT is having a new headquarter next month in Brooklyn Navy Yard. So we can also use that at the North and uh, Air Force Research Lab has, has a center in Rome, upstate New York. So now we have these collaborations with the Stony Brook, BNL, ESNet, which is the fiber provider for Department of Energy and Air Force to make this happen. Of course, all these researches are uh, on the academic side and, and the National Lab is sponsored by Department of Energy program for quantum networking. Our eventual goal as quantum mem uh, as Connect is to create something like this, a very complex network of hardware and software that can allow for long distance communication. Some of the quantum devices I already talked about you see here, but then you always need a lot of optoelectronic and accelerate systems in order to uh, make this really work in order to, uh, because for example, telecom fibers, they do not really preserve polarization. So you need devices to compensate for that. You need the devices to lock massive number of lasers across a network. And of course you need these controlling devices that for us are gonna be machine learning based to both control the networks and make the quantum devices work with each other uh, perfectly. I'm at my 25 minutes mark. See, I told you it may not be that short. So I have a couple of more minutes only yes, to talk about. You do, please. Yeah, so this is the, where we are going. QNX been established in uh, very late 2017. We've been very fortunate. We closed a seed round of 800K in December very much thanks to Quantum Notion. Quantum Notion was one of the very, very first investors who believed in our mission and they came in, which brought more investors and they could close this round. We also have raised around or gained around 1.7 million in non dilutives so far mainly from the Department of Energy and hopefully next week more good news from uh, the Air Force also in terms of uh, grants and SBIRs. And now we are opening a new uh, dilutive rounds to raise around 1.5 more millions and have a couple of more millions uh, proposals right now in review that we are very optimistic. Our goal is eventually to develop device by device to do field testing longer and longer to eventually get to this place that we have these long distance networks fully tested, integrated into telecom systems that can be used for cybersecurity, that can be used for distributed quantum computing and all the applications you can think of. Of course, this is a massive collaboration. So there are infinite number of people that their names are not here from BNL side, from Stony Brook side and all other people who are working with us. So I'm only gonna give a shout out to a few people. Eden Figueroa who was my PhD advisor and Miles Masters advisors. He is the visionary who came up with all these ideas and the passion to do everything at room temperature. And after a couple of decades of working literally 24 seven, he managed to make it happen. I did my PhD with him. Mile is our CTO currently. He's a very magical engineer. He's the one who 
change our portable memories from something on a breadboard into something that is actually very reliable and uh, rack mounted. And, and now we are very, very fortunate to have uh, Noelle Goddard as our CEO. She, she was the principal with Accelerate New York, but she is herself a physicist. So we could somehow convince her to join us full time. And since she's joined like literally the beginning of the time she started working with us, she managed to bring us to a whole new different level of uh, business. And now we are expanding our team. We hired two new scientists and a project manager. We are very, very excited to work with them after the COVID crisis is over. Our chairman also happens to be Bob Braille to be a uh, PhD and is one of the first business people who was with us. And something that I didn't mention, of course, like any other quantum uh, company, IP is very, very important for us because that's the most uh, value of the company comes from the IP. We have uh, published the PCT and several uh, provisionals on the quantum memories and integrations with networks. And we have this extensive list of things that we are filing for literally as I'm Speaking, uh, this is about it. To wrap it up, quantum communication really has the potential to be the first broadly used uh, technology, quantum technology out there, because it's really, first of all, it's a little bit easier than quantum computing, but it's also more mature and it's doable, especially with the entanglement swapping. Now you can reach goals that you couldn't do before, because now you can have this dream of having coast to coast or global uh, quantum networks. Maybe the last thing I want to quickly mention because this is really, really aligned with the mission of uh, Quantum Ocean is that we really believe in this, uh, bringing everyone to participate, all countries, all scientists, all teams together. This is the vision Eden had from day zero. That's why we have an ecosystem of industry uh, researchers working together. And we don't want to turn this into a competition of which country gets QKD first or like defense stuff. We really want to build an international uh, uh, collaboration to bring the good side of uh, quantum technologies out there. With that, I have to just give the final shout outs to our financial sponsors, of course, uh, Quantum Ocean sits at first and doing all the things they are doing right now to create this community. Accelerate New York Department of Energy and NSF being our founders and our mentors and incubators are CBIT, CBIT New Lab uh, and, and the Research Foundation because of course I forgot to mention something very important that we have this exclusive licensing deal with the university because the core technology has been developed there, the quantum memories. So SUNY RF is now also one of our partners. With that, I'm going to end the talk exactly at 30 minutes. Congratulations, Mehdi. And uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much for this very nice talk and presentation. And I'm, yeah, well, very happy to see all these progresses in quantum memories. So wish you the best of luck. Uh, mm -hmm. Because hardware is, uh, is hard and you are mixing hardware and software together. Uh, but uh, I really like the message that you shared and, and the way you concluded your presentation. So thank you and, and congratulations. Um, you. So um, we are, this is it for today. I hope uh, everyone enjoyed. I, I would particularly thanks all our panelists for all these precious insights and feedback and information and tips that they shared with us today. Thank you again, uh, all of you for, for everything you, you taught us today. Um, our next meeting, I hope that we'll be uh, that we'll be able to to join, to host uh, you all next time is on May twenty fifth. Remember, so we'll send you as always invitation through the meetups uh, and through LinkedIn and all available channel. Um, and I'd like also to attend to to thanks all our attendees. And again, if you'd like to join the Lab Quantique or start a chapter in your country or, or whatever, we'll be very pleased to. Uh, uh, help you, support you, and, uh, and work with you for uh, anything that you'd like to launch. Uh, thanks again to everyone, and wish you a very good evening or day wherever you are on the world. Thanks a lot, and goodbye. Thank you, everybody. Bye.